Ah, nós estamos aqui com o Kim Ives e o Dan Coffin. Ah, o Kim Ives ele é editor do jornal Haiti Liberté, que é um jornal independente, é, que tem sede em Nova York, entre a comunidade de haitianos lá e também em Porto Príncipe. E o Dan, ele trabalha junto com o jornal The Nation. Os dois foram responsáveis pelos documentos do Wikileaks no Haiti. Todas as revelações que saíram com relação ao Haiti passaram pela mão desses dois. One of the reasons that uh, you're here in, in the museum that you've been recently well known in the US is because you received the WikiLeaks documents. Now, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about uh, how was the process, how did you how, how did you publish, and what were the stories? Even though we have offices in Port-au-Prince in New York, uh, WikiLeaks wanted to deliver the documents directly to us in uh, Port-au-Prince, so. Uh, we uh, traveled from New York, and because the documents were in English, um, our New York office, as myself in particular, as uh, the principal English editor, um, I traveled to Port-au-Prince, where uh, we worked with our bureau chief there in receiving the documents. Can you uh, say some of the stories that came Some out? of them. Well, the first we began one was with the Petro Caribe story, which was a, a very uh, outrageous uh, campaign led by the U.S. Embassy on behalf of uh, the two U.S. Uh, oil giants, uh, Texo, uh, Texaco Chevron and Exxon Mobil, to torpedo the uh, granting to Haiti of a Petro Caribe deal uh, by Venezuela, whereby Haiti would receive all its energy needs, about 14,000 gallons a day, uh, in petroleum from uh, Venezuela, which uh, they would only have to pay 60% up front, and the remaining 40% is paid over 25 years at 1% interest. This saves the country $100 million a year. Um, something which even the U.S. Embassy recognized was in Haiti's interest, and yet they worked hard to torpedo this deal and to mm -hmm. make sure that it wouldn't happen. Did they manage to stop the deal? They did not. They managed to uh, slow it, but eventually Haiti won, and to some extent we wanted to start with something which was upbeat, which, which showed a Haitian victory, not to show. And yet it has yeah. to be said, too, this is about providing electricity mm -hmm. for Haitians to uh, to go to school, for hospitals to work, for municipal offices to function. Uh, when I uh, when when I lived there many years ago, you didn't have any electricity uh, in Haiti, or it was limited for a few hours a day. When I went back, I was struck. Well, Port-au-Prince now has electricity, and then you read in the WikiLeaks files why. Why they have electricity? Because the Venezuelans organized with the Haitian government to provide a flow of oil plus the technicians to run power plants to provide electricity. Which the Venezuelans and, built. And it makes you wonder, after 50 years of World Bank aid, of IMF, of uh, French government assistance, USAID, the Canadians, Inter-American Development Bank. Inter-American Development Bank. This huge system could not provide electricity to Haitians. And within two years, the Cubans and the Venezuelans get electricity to Haiti. It's incredible that this, this, this system goes on and nobody writes about it. Nobody talks about it. And there it is in WikiLeaks. And the Haitian government had to fight U.S. companies and the U.S. Embassy to get electricity so people could read. You know, could go to work. Could the, the hospitals could function? Uh, this is what happens in Haiti. The block, the block to development in Haiti comes from the United States and corporations. But this, but this is specifically about oil. Do you have uh, are there are the um, industries that block? We did another piece on the sweatshops in Haiti, where shirts, T-shirts are made by Levi Strauss, Hanes. Fruit of the Loom, big companies where they manufacture there, who fought against a minimum wage increase for Haitians from three dollars a day, you know, to five dollars a day. This is nothing. Haitians are the poorest mm -hmm. paid in the hemisphere, and yet the U.S. Embassy and uh, the Haitian sweatshop owners 
organized to block a minimum wage increase for Haitians to be able even just to eat and live. From and even three it, to five dollars. And yeah. Well, no, yeah, it, it, it had actually been at a dollar seventy-five, and they wanted to raise it to five dollars a day, but the U.S. Embassy worked with the Haitian contractors to limit it to three dollars a day. Even at five dollars a day, Haitians still would have been the cheapest labor in the hemisphere, but they blocked it at least for a year, they delayed it for a year, it is now at five dollars a day. It also has to be said that with the UN occupation of Haiti, Brazilian led, uh, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, not a, uh, excuse me, not Ecuador, but uh, uh, Chile, Argentinian troops, uh, uh, Uruguayan troops, the, uh, the UN troops there uh, suppressed the protests against uh, uh, a low minimum wage. Oh. They are there firing tear gas against the students and protesters who are fighting for a minimum wage increase. So this, these troops are not there for uh, providing stability and security. They're there to do the bidding of the sweatshop owners and the American companies who want low wage factories. And one of the other things the troops are doing are ensuring elections, uh, what they call elections, what the Haitians call selections. <laughs> and uh, what we saw in the WikiLeaks documents was precisely how these elections are pushed through despite the fact that they know that they are corrupted and no, uh, of no value. For instance, in the elections of the past year, 2010, they knew that the Electoral Council had uh, unjustly disqualified the largest political party in Haiti, the Lavalas Family Party mm -hmm. of then exiled pres former President Jean Bertrand Aristide. Mm -hmm. The US sat down with the European Union and a number of other so called friends of Haiti to discuss the matter. And they were uh, aware, or I should say, afraid that the disqualification of the Lavalas family would somehow jeopardize those elections. But they decided, and that was in the documents, that they had too much invested and that they needed to go forward with it. Not just that. But Why do you, call it, do you call it an occupation? And is this the, 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 the vision, the view of uh, the general uh, Haitian population? As they say in, in uh, Haitian Creole, uh, uh, constitutions are paper bayonets are made of steel. So they know very well that uh, it might mix right. And so this is uh, an occupation. And I just wanted to say, even if we were to accept that they were a quote unquote peacekeeping force, which they haven't been, they've been a war making force. Uh, but even uh, if- Peace, uh, peace force. Right? Yeah, even if they were, we were to say a peacekeeping force, a peacekeeping force is supposed to be neutral. They have not been neutral. They have taken the side of the coup makers. They have been fighting against the Lavalas. So even if we were to accept the premise that they were keeping the peace between the Lavalas, the people, and the bourgeoisie, the people who made the coup, they would treat them with equanimity. equanimity. But they don't. They uh, take the side of the coup makers. They sit with the uh, 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 assembly industry owners with the bourgeoisie and scheme against the people. This is made clear by the WikiLeaks documents and this is among the things that we point out in our series. But, uh, but this has been made clear by the WikiLeaks documents in which way? The one clear example is the way that the UN <coughs> in Haiti worked with the United States to prevent Aristide from returning. So they were scheming, according to the WikiLeaks cables, that they would, that Aristide would have to take a plane from South Africa through Europe to get back to Haiti. They would work with the various countries like Germany and wherever the plane would land to block the plane from landing. Mm -hmm. The Absurd. UN was doing this. The UN was doing this. The UN, the head of the UN in Haiti, Edmund Moulet, who now is also a senior peacekeeping official in New York, was scheming with the United States, was asking the United States to concoct a prosecution of Aristide to prevent 
to charge him with corruption or something, just anything, to stop him from being so popular with Haitians. So he could not get traction, were his, were his very words, so he could not get traction with the Haitian people. Os documentos do Wikileaks mostraram também a, a, a pressão que os americanos estavam fazendo para que a, a, o comandante da, das tropas, é, o general Augustoliano, fosse, tivesse uma ação mais agressiva, mais violenta dentro das favelas é, do Haiti. So, we, when I was in Haiti, to meet you guys, uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised by the fact that Brazil or Brazilians or the Brazilian military are not that they're well seen as we see the reports in here all the time that they're doing a great job there but but when you're there you see like when you start when you're in public and you start talking about the the, the military the, the UN people react violently they say we are fed up like spontaneously and you see on walls you see like Abba Minusta get out of here kind of thing there is a feeling that, that that the UN has been there for too long. Why? Okay, in the beginning, I think Haitians had gone through three years of destabilization and there was, um, I could say, almost a cynicism towards the uh, UN. They called them touristas. They were seen as tourists because they spent a lot of the time going in their vehicles around, um, <laughs> polluting, leaving open cesspools, uh, and uh, they were uh, seen as, um, uh, you know, at the beach and that kind of thing. So they were calling them tourists. This was around <laughs> Haiti. But uh, gradually, with time, they have carried out massacres in Cité Soleil, in Bel Air. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of people who have died under UN bullets or been wounded. So. Increasingly, the cynicism, and I could say um, uh, almost uh, disregard for the UN, uh, has become a hostility, has become a hatred of the UN, because they are seen as a force which is uh, killing, polluting, and also taking money, because here are people who are starving, who don't have money to eat, they've had an earthquake which has destroyed their capital, uh, and yet we see 854 million dollars a year on average going to uh, pay these uh, 12,000 now troops, 13,000 almost, uh, to uh, do this job in Haiti. So the people are saying, why? You know, why are we being uh, um, uh, one uh, repressed like this? Uh, and polluted like this, and uh, the question of cholera has now really been, uh, I won't call it a straw that broke the camel's back, but really the, um, the log that broke the camel's what back. What happened with the cholera? Well, essentially, Nepalese troops, uh, Nepalese contingent, uh, came back last October from Nepal, where cholera is endemic, and uh, they had uh, very uh, sloppy and uh, negligent sanitation practices where essentially their sewage was being dumped into the headwaters of the Artibonite River, the principal river in Haiti. Without which, any treatment. Without any treatment. In this river, people drink from it, people wash in it, people use it for everything. And it began, the cholera began to spread in that area, and the UN minimized the problem, uh, the Haitian government at the time minimized the problem, and it spread like wildfire. Uh, there is a suit that has been brought by the uh, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti against the UN for reparations to Haiti for having unleashed this cholera epidemic, which is now, at this point, claimed 6,600 lives and sickened uh, half a million people. But again, you see this in the WikiLeaks cables where they're writing that the sanitary practices of the UN troops are poor. Be, and, it, and it goes to the mentality that they don't care about Haiti. They come in with, they establish 26 bases. So this is a base that was established just All across before. the country. Yeah. They put in these military and police bases all across the country. This is part of their occupation. And yet, when they set up, they don't think about the local people. 
about the community, about being good neighbors, mm -hmm. about not putting your waste, your sewage, into the river. But it goes to the point mm -hmm. of uh, negligence and cr really a criminal negligence on the part of the UN that has now created an epidemic that has infected nearly 500,000 people, 5% of the entire population of the country, and killed 66,600 6, people, and it continues. The other part of the negligence is you have to move aggressively to contain the problem, mm -hmm. and they have not. When the news started to spread that there was a, a cholera epidemic, I, I myself interviewed the, the ambassador of uh, Brazil in Haiti and he said that it has nothing to do with the UN troops. This has been denied over and over again. I want to know, when was this found? What's the proof that it, had, that it came from? There the have been many studies. The first one that uh, really determined that it was a, a, a responsible for the UN troops and it has to be said that the Haitian people knew from the start that it came from that Nepalese base up at the headwaters of the Artibonite River up near Mirabadi. Because you were talking to the people. Yes, and, um, and, and, and they knew it very well. And, you know, all this circumstantial evidence pointed to that. But um, a medical team uh, from France came in and looked at the microbes of the, because uh, cholera is a bacterial disease. Uh, spread just through sanitation. It's not viral, it's bacterial. And they uh, e examined that bacteria and compared it to the one in Nepal and they found an exact match. Mm. And then this uh, same process was done by a UN team and they also found an exact match. When it was they, when... in, in, this was done uh, within the last year. Uh, the, the UN team, I think, was uh, about uh, three to four months ago, they finally came out. Interestingly, in the UN report, while they said there was an exact match and it was very likely, but they didn't actually say that it was the UN. But the um, it, it's it's quite established in the scientific community, it's like look, and so the people are fed up. They want the minister out. Uh, um, I could say I one more straw that came was this video of a rape of a young man, or what appears to be, uh, if it's not a rape, it's at least a sexual harassment of some sort. His family, and he claimed that's the case, uh, the community there feels it's the case. Uh, now, in, now in that video, which is uh, one of the big things that came up lately, there's three uh, Uruguayan soldiers holding a four. black four. Mm -hmm holding a, a black man down and, and one of them actually takes like his penis out and... and well, you don't actually see that. You see he has no shirt on. No, you see, see him, him taking yeah. the thing up. Anyway, he, 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 gets <laughs> close to, <laughs> he gets close to the man and then we don't really see if there is a rape or not. And then yeah. he's released. But one of the things that... For them, for the four soldiers... This was in, inside the military uh, facility, right? Yes. What's the kind of atmosphere that allows that to happen, even if it wasn't a rape, but that allows that to happen within a UN? Uh... The atmosphere is that the UN soldiers do not see Haitians as humans. It is a complete objectification of the enemy. They are the other. They are subhuman. They are toys. They are animals. So basically they function in the country with impunity, they undermine the uh, justice system. So when there, when there are stories like the, the story of the Uruguayan or other stories, we, we've seen how many were there? Were there 150 soldiers from the Sri Lankan, uh, was it? Yes, 171 who were sent back home. Who had to be sent back home because they were ex sexually exploiting. I mean, and that's like, it's not really prostitution. They're trading money for mobile phones or food or like electricity. Like, in a, in a country of uh, poverty. These people cannot get prosecuted in Haiti, right? Correct, right. They, they get immunity and then whatever happens to them, Haiti has no control at all. Right. I think to, to, to end, uh, I want to ask you about how was the repercussion of the revelations of the WikiLeaks cables, which you managed, and Kim, we, I heard you are not you cannot go safely back to Haiti now. 
Well, uh, it would be a question. I think I would let Dan uh, respond since he wrote the article about uh, the repercussions. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, some of the articles, uh, uh, you know, we were, we were just uh, uh, carrying the message, but sometimes if you don't like the message, you shoot the messenger. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, Haiti Liberté, uh, has received threats um, uh, and uh, for writing, reproducing what the U.S. ambassadors were writing about Haiti uh, and about different Haitian politicians. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, uh, these Haitian politicians obviously don't like the message and they're gangsters, they're killers, uh, and so therefore they're targeting uh, the messenger. And so it, it hasn't been safe uh, to, to um, uh, to uh, go back to Haiti. J just to close uh, the conversation, I think uh, I, I would want to ask you, so you've had a good impact, you've, you've been seen in the US, the story went out, the story is into the nation, but at the end you're threatened, you can't go back. I wanted you to talk a little bit about the role of being an independent media and, and uh, mm -hmm. does it make a difference in a country like Haiti? Has it made a difference? Was oh. it good that you had to go? Absolutely. But, it, it, but you say it has an impact. Oh, it, it, more than an impact. I, I would say the media war in uh, the war uh, that our, our mankind is fighting for its liberation, the media war is, I could say, the first and most important because most people are not neutralized by a billy club or a gun. They are neutralized through mind control, mm -hmm. through informational control. That is, people believe what they're told, what they're fed, what's injected into their brain. And so the media, the war of information, of ideology, of letting people know what the truth is, what is happening, what really is going on, not the official line, that is the most important. And so it is very gratifying and it's important that especially young people coming out, becoming involved in uh, uh, journalism, in information, realize that they play a critical role in bringing out the truth and, and pulling back the curtain on the uh, uh, scheming and uh, uh, conspiracies and cabals and uh, 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 misdeeds that are happening at high places.